one of the things that I went through when I was younger was um, I got a chance to live with some Christian roommates, and each one of them had come from a different religious background. One of them was a friend's church, kind of like a Quaker, sort of. Another one came from Calvary, was a Sunday school teacher. Another one was going to, I forget where he was going. He's kind of different, but anyway, I forget where he was going to. One of the churches somewhere else. But um, each one of them had a different perspective and a different ability to share with me, and I had a chance to rap with them at different times with different questions I might have had. We never really had a home Bible study in our home, but it's funny because I remember um, Cheryl visiting once, so, you know, and that was kind of interesting. Was that um, kind of like a vision, you know? It was like, man, oh, well, anyway, she was just full of the joy of the Lord at the time. I remember because she still looks like she's got the joy of the Lord. <laughs> One of those shameless plugs. But what I wanted to do was that in. Bible Disciple is that I wanted to take a look at one of the things that I admired about a Christian publication that had come out in my day, which was called the Open Bible. And I have one back over here. It's a big old giant one on the far right, just kind of beat up. It says, you know, the King James Open Bible, blah, blah, blah. But it's the old Open Bible, which had the Master Life Study line, Master Life Study Outlines in it. And then the Christian Encyclopedic of in Index of Knowledge or something, something like that. Some kind of like mini concordance. And it was like the perfect Bible. And then afterwards they tried to improve it. And of course, in my opinion, messed it all up. <laughs> so of course we're using one of the messed up ones. Um, that one's still good, but I'd rather not use something that you might not be able to find. And I'd rather use something that maybe, you know, will bring me up to the 20th century, you know, where. I'm not a King James only person. I don't use any Bible there is. I just happen to memorize everything in the King James because I happen to be one of the few people that really does understand uh, Elizabethan English and understands word origins as well as uh, has an artistic or poetic mindset that I like to kind of give the flow to the, the scriptures that they have in sometimes Dewey Reams Bible like in Psalms or in the um, King James Bible in a lot of the New Testament. So, you know, a variety of Bibles I use at different times for different reasons. So, in this study, um, Bible Disciple, we're going to use the Christian Life Study Outlines, or let's see, what are they called? Are they called Christian Life Study Outlines? They are called the Master Outline and Study Notes. Wow. From Thomas Nelson Publishers. Let me make sure, I want to make sure that I got this right. Yeah, Master Outline. So it's the outlines of the Bible. And um, basically it's set up the same way as that it was in those days. Christian, oh yeah, they are called that. Christian Life Master Study Outlines and Study Notes. I think you can see that. And the one that I'm using happens to be a new King James Version Bible, which means that I'll be totally confused because it'll mess me up <laughs> as far as memorization is concerned. But the point being is that in relating the way that these are presented. It's more like a discipleship material and it's something that you can do with the Bible study um, Bible, meaning a, a Bible that's got all the notes and all the other little gimmicks and you know cool little neato things that you could do in order to conduct a Bible study on the spur of the moment with anybody that you want to to cover all the basic topics of Christian life. I think that one of the best things that you can do is to get a study Bible, you know, is to get one, mark it up, you know, tear it up, rip it up, shred it, you know, and get a new one. <laughs> and for the sake of a Bible study, I've even taken a Bible one time and tore it right in half. You know, I mean, I've done all kinds of things. I've given away Bibles, my, my study Bibles even at times. You know, somebody said they didn't have a Bible, I give it to them. You know, mine, the one I marked up. <laughs> you know, and they, I think they thank me. Maybe they didn't like it. <laughs> oh. Oh well. But the point being is that I get my Bibles now instead of brand new, except for that one when I had to go try to track it down. But I try to get my Bibles, you know, ones that I like, and you know, use them use stores, and I usually collect them so I have a version of everything. I enjoy it that way. And um, what we're going to do though in Bible Discipled 101 is to take each subject just as they are, read them 
discuss them and do them. So that way it's just pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. It's matter of fact, reading what it says and saying what it reads and doing what it says. You know, in other words, kind of like what the Bible says what it means. It means what it says. So, if you're a disciple of Jesus and you want to follow along, you can get you know I guess go out and get one. It's a Thomas Nelson the New King James Version Bible. Christian Life Edition, so that it has the Christian Life Master Outlines in it. Um, they'll have something out there that's either the same or pretty close. So it's no big deal. You know, if you can follow along with what I read, either quick or slow or fast or in between, then praise the Lord. If not, well, then, you know, replay the tape. <laughs> but Father, I thank you that you've given us your spirit, that we can always turn our lives over to you, to be discipled by you, to be led by you, to be filled by you, to be really just living in you. Because without you, we would have no being. Our life would not exist. There would be nothing in this universe except a blank space where we once were. But because you do love us, and because you've allowed us this time, we want to give it back to you in a way of celebration of life, a way to joyfully celebrate the things that you have taught us and inspired us with your word. So God, I ask you to come and be part with us, that you would instruct us in the way that we should go, that we would understand and be revealing in what you are revealing, I should have said, Lord, in what you are revealing to us of yourself. Because I know that in the fullness of this book that I hold in my hands, there you are, Jesus. So I thank you that you're here, that you're discipling us, that it's as though we were sitting at the Sea of Galilee and we're waiting for every single word that comes out of your mouth. Give us, oh God, the ability to hear you in a way that we never thought of before. Amen. And so, in Christian Life Master Outlines, I'll kind of cover a brief outline of it, and then I'll go into number one. <laughs> so, the outline goes like this. Group one, the Bible. And in group one, number one, is the inerrancy of the scriptures. And then number two, foundation for Bible study. In group two, God and three persons. Number one, doctrine of God. Number two, names of God. Number three, sovereignty of God. Number four, uniqueness of Jesus. Number five, the deity of Christ. Number six, the deity of, oh, number five, the deity of Christ as person. Number six, the deity of Christ as signs. Number seven, Messianic Psalms. And number eight, the Holy Spirit's ministry. His ministry. Whew. What are if it said it so far? Did they change that one? Number uh, group three will be spirit beings and it will be angels, followed by Satan's, followed by demons. Or followed by Satan, followed by demons. Group four will be man. And number one will be what the Bible teaches about man. Number two, the doctrine of sin. Number three, consequences of sin. Number four, heaven and hell. And number five, the judgments. In group five, salvation, it will begin with number one, man's ruin and God's remedy. Number two, blood of Jesus Christ from Genesis to Revelation. Number three, so great a salvation. Number four, repentance. Number five, spiritual birth. Number six, what is faith. Number seven, the Christian life. In group six, the inner life. It will be number one, as a man thinks, number two, fear, number three, worship, number four, God's will, number five, lessons on prayer, number six, prayers of Moses, number seven, prayers of the prophets. And in group seven, Israel, it will be number one, for the Jew first, number two, the birth and history of the Hebrew nation, Number three, the tabernacle. Number four, the Old Testament sacrifices. In group seven, the church. It will be the beginning of the church, followed by the nature of the church, followed by the ordinance of the church. In group nine, it will be the king's manifesto. <laughs> okay. Uh, citizens of the kingdom, followed by manifesting kingdom principles, followed by making kingdom choices, followed by entering the kingdom. Some of these will be interesting because I'm not even quite sure what they're going to say. Some of them already know because they were included in the original. Uh, number 10 will be three Bible characters. One, Enoch, a man who walked with God. Two, Noah, a man who built the ark. And three, Paul the Apostle. And in the last one, group 11, the last days. First will be seven parables of the kingdom of heaven. Next one followed by crowns for Christians. Next, the four phases of the second coming. Followed by Daniel, the prophet, his life. Followed by Daniel, the prophet, his visions. And then seven sevens of the revelation. So, having said all that, we're going to start off with Master Life 
outline number one, inerrancy of the scriptures. Boy, I'm glad this is a discipleship thing because that means that you have to be discipled so you're used to sitting for hours. <laughs> for centuries, the vast majority of people in the Christian world accepted the scriptures as the Holy Bible and believed it to be God's revealed written message to mankind. They believed it was free of mistakes, inerrant, that it could not be wrong on any subject, infallible, and that its words came from God himself through specially chosen prophets, inspired. Jewish believers had held this same opinion for centuries before with respect to the Old Testament, and the Orthodox Jews still hold this view today. The belief that the Bible was God's written word and free from error was seen to be the Bible's only claim for itself from 2 Timothy 3.16, as well as the authoritative claim of Christ himself from John 10.35. Thus, Orthodox Christians today, whether their denominational label, whatever their denominational label, still hold, <coughs> still hold the doctrine that the Holy Scriptures, both Old and New Testament, <coughs> are God's actual words to man, originated by him and communicated by his Holy Spirit's guidance through chosen holy messengers. 2 Peter 1 20 and 21 and thus are verbally written words not merely the thoughts inerrant, infallible and inspired as they were originally written in the autographs that is in the actual documents penned by the prophets and apostles or by their secretaries when dictated Romans 16 22 in contrast to the orthodox position, men have periodically risen and attacked the biblical accuracy. It is in unbelief they have rejected the creation account, rejected miracles, and rejected the deity of Jesus, and many other great and eternal truths expounding theories which attack the inerrancy of the Holy Scriptures. During the past two centuries, there has been an increase of negative criticism of the Bible in schools of learning, and it has filtered down to our public education system. In light of this, we invite the reader to consider carefully the following questions, or the following reasons drawn from the Bible itself for believing in the inerrancy of the scriptures. Number one, and we'll look at that. The Bible declares itself to be the word of God. And that's found in 2 Timothy 3.16. So turn with me to 2 Timothy 3.16. Uh, I should probably mark this so I can go back to it. And 2 Timothy 3.16. And you probably have that memorized, as most of us do, but we, for the sake of people that don't, that's why we flip to it and read it. In 2 Timothy 3.16, we have, <laughs> As usual, when these life study allies, what does that say? Second Timothy three sixteen. Oh, we're well, looking on the wrong page. <laughs> Boy, small print. In Second Timothy three sixteen, our outline, so to speak, says the Bible declares itself to be the Word of God, and Second Timothy three sixteen says all Scripture is given. I knew I didn't want to read this in the King James. It's going to mess up my memorization, but we'll say it in this new King James. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. So, what does that mean? Well, you ask, down at the bottom of the page, it tells you what it means. The Bible declares itself to be the word of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. This great declaration explains and affirms why the Bible alone has been the final authority for the faith and practice of evangelical Christianity throughout the centuries. Note that, one, all scripture refers to the entire Bible, Old and New Testament, from the creation account in Genesis to the new heaven and new earth in the book of Revelation. Two, all scripture refers to the written word. The doctrine of biblical inerrancy asserts that the God's Holy Word or Holy Spirit so guided holy men of God, 2 Peter 1.21, so that the words they wrote and which they have preserved as our Bible were kept free from error, in fact or doctrine, 
it is not affirmed that Luke never erred as a person, rather that when he penned his gospel and the book of Acts, God's spirit, by a special act of supernatural superintendence, so guided these particular writings that they, A, said what God wished to be said, and B, were written error-free in the original copies. That's what we affirm. And then three, all scripture refers to the 39 Old Testament books which were received as the scripture at the time the Apostle Paul wrote these words, plus the 27 New Testament works then being written, which already had been pre-authenticated by Christ in John 16, 12, and 13. When Paul wrote to Timothy in the first Christian century, the complete canon, official list of the Old Testament scriptures in Hebrew consisted of 22 books. Josephus, a Jewish historian who lived in the first century AD, wrote that the holy books of the Hebrews were 22, the same as the number of letters in their alphabet. These 22 Old Testament books are identical to the 39 books of our Old Testament, differing only in how they were divided, example being 1st and 2nd Samuel combined as one book. At the same time, 27 New Testament books in Greek were coming into existence and had the same authority for the church as the Old Testament. Four, by inspiration of God. Theonoustos in Greek literally means God breathed. The author of the Bible is declared to be God himself as he breathed the words through the mouths and pens of his chosen prophets, 2 Peter 1.21. The Old Testament books claimed to be God's word numerous times. They were accepted by prophets and faithful through the centuries as from God, hence inerrant, 2 Kings 2.28, 11, and 13. In fact, in many cases, the biblical words came directly as the speech of God. I, the Lord, keep it. I water it every moment, lest any hurt it, I keep it night and day. Isaiah 27, 3. Six, the New Testament books were accepted by the church as scripture, even in the day of their writing. Thus, Peter was already considering Paul's epistle as scripture, 2 Peter 3, 15. Likewise, the book of Revelation proclaims that God's judgments will befall anyone who dares to add to or subtract from the words of this prophecy, Revelation 22, 18. It labels itself as a prophecy, a holy message from God. As part of the scripture, it cannot be improved by additions or deletions. It is complete and inerrant. In examining this, because we get overwhelmed by lots of dissertation in churches, we'll stop now and pick up in the next video, Christ taught the inerrancy and some of the other portions of it so that way we don't overwhelm if it gets to be too long-winded, especially with the introduction that I gave and all the aspects of it. But what I would like to say, especially based upon this information that all all inspiration is given by God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction and in righteousness, so that the holy man be fully equipped, rightly dividing the word of truth, that all of it, God gave. And that when we know that God did it, then you don't get this idea of how someone could distort it, because if you think you can change the inerrancy from God doing it to man doing it, then somehow you've made God into man. Do you see what I mean? In other words, it doesn't matter whether you use a King James or an ASB or a Living Bible or whatever Bible you use. It doesn't really matter. I mean, that's not the big deal. Some minor words change here and there, and people think that somehow it's going to like you know screw you up because one place here it doesn't have it, but every place else it does. It isn't. You know, I deal with the subject of fallacy and how you can kind of brainwash people with using different types of disinformation or miscommunicated information to draw, you know, corollaries and to do all kinds of things to your brain that you don't realize you're doing by subliminal perceptions and subliminal argumentation. That doesn't happen in scripture. It's inspired. It has an ability to take care of itself, no matter what version you're using. Because it's the Holy Spirit who did it in the first place, and he's the one who's doing it in the second. So, when you get into this whole idea of inerrancy, you don't have to worry too much theologically about it. You just have to worry about as a Jesus disciple, whether he said it, and he did. So, because he said it, we're going to get into the next part that talks about it. But in this part about the inerrancy, 
there's so much proof that you don't need to go there. You don't need to be a scholar to try to prove that it's true. It's just interesting when you read it that, hey, there's 22 books, you know, and 37, and the reason why there's a difference is because they combine them. No big deal. It's also, when you publish it, there's... I'll tell you right now. Oh, <laughs> they separated. There's over 1,400 pages in this book. Oh, no, wait a minute. In your Bible, there's 1,600 pages. Oh, wait a minute. There's 1,800 pages. doesn't matter. It's fine print, big print, small print. See how silly some of the arguments get? And when people argue about whether it's inspired or not, then they're trying to make God small and man big. So don't go there. Accept it, and then just adapt to what's being said so that you know that in Scripture, it's interesting that you have something as a disciple to fall back on. There is always proofs for your faith. You should always have not a question of faith that believes in something you can't see, but you should have an intelligent faith that can prove what you can't see by what you can see. In other words, God is demonstrative. He is interventionist. He can be known by way of what he has done in creation as well as intervening in your personal life. The same thing is true about the Bible. This scripture can be proven bluntly by demonstrating it to people as a communication device between a holy God and an unholy man. And God does it, and I've done it several times with people all the time, and before we get through this discipleship study in Bible Discipled, you will see me flip open a scripture and say, Thus saith the Lord. Well, I won't use those words, because <laughs> I already know the Bible says don't use those words. So whenever the Bible says don't do something, don't do it. But the point is, is that God is and he'll speak to you and he'll speak to me and we'll know that God spoke. And the beauty of that is that it's not meant to be the way he does it all the time, but, you know, occasionally, you know, you need a quick word. Don't need anybody look. Thank you, Lord. Wow, you're talking to me. <laughs> but, no, in the volume of the book, he is speaking to you. And that's how the Holy Spirit makes it work. So, inerrancy is done by spiritual means, not just provable means. But your faith that's intelligent is done by provable means so that you can prove and approve what is acceptable in the will of God. That way there is no questions. You know, you don't doubt yourself and you don't worry about, am I hearing voices? <laughs> yes, I am. Well, which voices are they? I don't know which voices they are. Are they God? Yeah. Well, but you can walk with God, talk with God, and be with Jesus because Jesus is called the Word of God. And if Jesus is in there, I think calling him the Word of God is a pretty good idea because... I think the word's inerrant, and so is Jesus too. Ooh, that's cool. So, Father, I thank you that you've given us your word. You've proven, or at least you've begun to prove, and you've begun to show us and to reveal to us how in your word, by your word, through your word, and through the word of God that Jesus is, you're demonstrating why it is inerrant. Because there's no sin in Jesus, and there's no sin in this word. There's no error in it. It is accurate according to the way you designed it. Now, if there's mistakes of print and the mistakes of thought or whatever, then God, you put them there for a purpose. And they're designed that way for that reason. So God, I don't have any problem with it either way. Whether there was errors or not errors or common errors or whatever errors. Because there aren't any. It is what you wanted it to be. And such as it is, God, I accept it. So Father, I pray for those who are still trying to learn as a disciple who you are. And show them the truth of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, be a disciple. Follow up on your homework. Get one of these. Don't spend money. <laughs> or look up Christian Life Master Outlines, maybe on the internet, and Google it, and you'll probably find it. <laughs> God bless.